Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 280 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis, here as always with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Megan. How are you? I am doing great because we are going to be doing one of my favorite kinds of episodes, which is when we talk about things we love about a time or a stage or a phase that maybe there are some things to not love about. So kind of turn it a little bit on its, um, on its head. And today we are talking about the fourth trimester, which also is known as postpartum, which is such a terrible word, isn't it? It is. Well, it sounds very clinical and, and there are some clinical things about it, but there's so much more. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. 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 You, you were the inspiration for this loose series and it was, uh, I think about a year ago or almost a year ago, you talked about how you were keeping a journal of things that you actually liked about being single over the holidays. Um, that's right. I forgot that was the genesis of this. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was very, I liked it because it was so actionable and so specific and you and I, I think longtime listeners know we are not one to just try to put on a smile and see the good and silver linings. Like we're, we want to acknowledge the hard when there is hard. Um, and I think this leaves room to still do that, but there's no, there's no harm from, like you said, flipping the script a little bit and saying, okay, well, this is really hard. Um, and I am really struggling, but what are some very specific things that maybe I wouldn't have, if not for this hard situation, you can do that with COVID. You can do that with virtual learning at home. You did it with being single at the holidays. And so today we are going to do it with the postpartum period. And and that implies the given, which is the fourth trimester is really, really hard. So this is not us waxing nostalgic about how fun it is to have a newborn baby, um, because in fact, we've had multiple episodes about how hard it is to have a newborn baby. Yeah. But it is um, it has been a kind of fun exercise to look back at some of the very granular, the very specific memories we have of the postpartum period that you can't get unless you also go through the hard part. I think that's the fun part of this series is like you're already going through something hard, but there are a few built in whatever you want to call them perks, silver linings yeah. um, that you don't really get to have if not for wading through that difficult season. So I think this is going to be fun. Me too. I'm excited. Um, and just before we before we launch in, um, we do have some great episodes in the archives. If you're newer around here, um, my interview with Kate Rope um, about her book Strong as a Mother is, I think, our most downloaded voices interview ever. She talks about postpartum um, maternal health, and um, it's a fascinating conversation. And then you and I have a fun one called Postpartum Symptoms and Surprises, where we talk about all the weird, gross stuff that happened. So. I will link those up and you can kind of use those as a companion to this one. But today we're going to focus on on the fun stuff. And Sarah, did you do you know that I actually wrote a book about postpartum? Well, remind me, because I feel like it was before I knew you. (laughs) It was. It was a long time ago. I had almost forgotten. I wrote a whole book and it was like um, an the everything series that they're green. So they're kind of like like the dummies or complete idiot's guide or whatever. But it's everything. And they're little green books, paperbacks. They're not as big as a, as a dummy's guide. And I can't, I remember the, the title being really awkward because they were trying to slide it into the health, like the everything health guide to or something. And it was postpartum. Um, and so I actually wrote a book on the postpartum period. It probably came out in 2006, maybe. Is it still available? I don't know. I imagine you could probably get, I'm sure it's out of, um, I'm sure it's out of print because they probably had to update stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, that those kinds of things don't usually stay in print very long unless they, unless they do a re a new edition of it. But, um, it may be, we may be able to find on Amazon. I really don't know. Interesting. It was a really fascinating book to write because I remember thinking there were so many things that I had never read, like read about in a book that happened to me <laughs> that I was like, someone ought to write a book about this. And then it was one of those, like where I, I got contacted, they, they already had the title, they were going to do it and they needed a writer. And I don't even remember how it happened. It was so long ago, but yeah, yeah well, I, I wrote I, the book. That's you wrote the book on postpartum. And that is so true of postpartum too, because I remember asking my healthcare provider about a couple of things and then being like, yeah, it's not really that common. Or, and then you talk to other women and it's totally that common. So that's how yeah. wide the, 
the gamut of symptoms are. Um, okay, well, we are going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll start 10 things we love about the fourth trimester. Megan, I got to spend some time with my nieces recently who are one and three, and it was so fun, but it really reminded me just how much work it is to have a couple of toddlers around. Everything from getting them dressed to going outside to mealtime, it's just a big production. Oh my gosh, I totally remember mealtimes with an older baby or toddler. So you have to make sure they have baby safe foods or toddler safe foods. You try to offer a balanced meal. Make sure the food is cut up to the right size. Make sure it doesn't all end up ground into the carpet or in the dog's stomach. (laughs) Well, our sponsor, Nurture Life, cannot help with that last part, but they have everything else covered. Nurture Life delivers freshly made healthy meals specifically for kids directly to your door, starting with babies 10 months old and all the way up through teens and adults. I've been really impressed by the quality of the meals and the portion sizes are just right too. And my little nieces got to try them and loved the mac and cheese. Nurture Life recently launched some brand new meals for baby stage three and toddlers and kids, as well as some limited time meals that will be available for just a few weeks, including butter chicken with peas, rice and mini naan, Japanese inspired chicken and veggie noodles, and breakfast sandwich with roasted potato medley. Nurture Life is offering a limited time discount to our listeners. When you go to nurture.life slash the mom hour and use promo code mom hour 30, you'll get 30% off your first two orders. That's promo code MOMHOUR30 to get 30% off your first two orders at nurture.life slash the mom hour. Check it out. Megan, September always feels like a great reset month, even in the crazy year 2020. So if our listeners have been hearing about the Ritual for Women multivitamin but haven't tried it yet, I think now is a great time. Our sponsor Ritual has obsessively researched every ingredient in their multivitamin because they believe you should be able to see where each nutrient is coming from and why they chose it. No hidden surprises. I've never taken a daily multivitamin quite like Ritual. It looks so pretty and there's this little mint essence tab in the bottle. So when you open it up, you get like this little fresh blast and the capsules themselves are easy to swallow for those of you who don't love taking pills like me. I leave the bottle right on my bedside table where it looks great and reminds me to do that one little act of self-care once a day. Ritual uses really high quality ingredients like vegan algal oil instead of fish oil, which leads to less environmental contamination and folate in its absorbable form because 40% of women can't properly utilize the synthetic form of folate or folic acid. These are little details that the team at Ritual has done the scientific research on so that I don't have to worry about it, which I love. We talk all the time on this show about how little improvements to our daily routines can make a big difference in how we feel. And starting a daily ritual with the essential for women is easy. Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off your first three months. To try it out satisfaction guaranteed, go to ritual.com slash the mom hour to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash the mom hour. All right, here we go. When we started brainstorming this, this was the very first thing that came to mind and might be my very favorite thing about the fourth trimester. And that is that my appetite was great and I loved eating all the things. I I relished (laughs) eating food, all food, healthy food, cookies, sandwiches. And uh, my third pregnancy, I was legitimately very nauseous for about 20 weeks, like way longer than first trimester. And even after I didn't have, you know, constant nausea, I was never quite right with food, my food aversions. And then um, I was never, I didn't get as much heartburn as some pregnant people do, but the third time I got some heartburn and then just toward the end, you know, you get so full so fast. So you're hungry, but Mm -hmm. the, the pleasure in eating you're never satisfied, really. You're, yeah. Something is always off. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, the second trimester is pretty good. You know, you're no longer nauseous. You're hungry, but you're not so big that you get full fast. So there might have been a few weeks in there where, you know, I enjoyed eating, but I loved eating in the postpartum period. And then that kind of opened up a, a bigger category for me, which is I think I took a lot of pleasure in physical comforts. Um you know, soft blankets and soft socks and being warm when I was cold. And I don't know if it's because you're home a lot more and you're just kind of aware of your physical comfort. But I think there's something about being so physically and emotionally raw that you also, it's almost like the pleasure centers are heightened too, because you, you're, you're going through a lot that's physically uncomfortable. So I just remember having a deep appreciation for things like a hot shower brushing my hair felt so good. Um, So I just have this very physical memory of those kinds of satisfactory, um, you know, sensory experiences, starting with eating and food, but then all the way, you know, all the way across the spectrum. 
Well, and I think you're, it's just a very, like, I don't mean sexual, but I mean sensual time. Yes. Like you're very, you're holding a baby, your skin is exposed, you're touching them. Like every, you're so dialed down. Um, and there's like all these smells and feelings and things like that, that like are so specific to that time. So I can totally see why like every sensory, it's like the sensoriness of it um, is like on over on overload, yeah. uh, which makes a lot of sense. Um, well, this is another physical thing. Um, I was just fascinated with my boobs, like <laughs> completely fascinated. So before having kids, I was like, you know, an, a barely an A cup. And then I would have a baby and they would become like a D cup. And, but then they would <laughs> fluctuate. They'd be like, they'd go between, you know, like swing back and forth, like rapidly from B to D and be all over the place. And I was fascinated with what my boobs were doing. Like with my first, um, with my first baby, they were very leaky. I had a lot of leaking, like tons, like spraying and leaking. And it was crazy. The other babies, they kind of got under control, but I definitely remember that feeling of being like, the baby took an extra long nap and now my breasts are two, like two yeah. sizes bigger than usual. And how I just found that fascinating. And then also I did have like really bad nipple soreness with almost all of my babies, except I think Clara. And that may have been because she was um, in the hospital for several days. So I was pumping and I think like I got past the stage where they hurt because I was pumping yeah. like for two days pretty exclusively. So anyway, um, but once my nipples stopped feeling like, you know, hot razor blades were being stabbed into them with every feeding. I loved breastfeeding. I was just obsessed with like the physiology of it and how your body custom makes the milk for like how old your baby is and what yeah. time of day it is and all that. Like I was just, I just like, I just, the feeling of letting down, I thought was fascinating. Like everything about it. I loved. Yeah. So except for the pain that was yeah. so fun. Yes. Um, I want to put on record that we have now talked about nipples for two episodes in a row. So in case that, wow, in case yes. we want to have a streak of some kind or <laughs> make this an annual occurrence. I think we could find a way to work it in pretty much every episode from now, from now on out. Oh, okay. Well, another memory that I had that was a very happy one was standing at the kitchen sink without having to awkwardly reach forward or turn sideways because of the big old belly. And so mm. then I thought, well, maybe this is just about, I loved not being pregnant anymore. Um, but that's not totally true. Cause we could do a whole episode of, you know, 10 things we loved about being pregnant, but there's something about the end of a pregnancy and the size of that belly that even though postpartum is physically hard, you have all kinds of new things that hurt and new, new things that make your physical life difficult the absence of belly was just a relief in some ways. And so for me, it was standing at the kitchen sink doing dishes and just being like, I remember that sensation of like, I could actually put my abdomen right up close to the sink drain board, you know, like the sink counter and not like be, it wouldn't, you know, it's not in the way and being like, oh my gosh, this is such a relief. I can stand here, but that right. it could be um, sleeping on your stomach for some people. I'm not a stomach sleeper, but I know that's that same kind of like, thank goodness the belly's gone. And it's not that like, <laughs> you're ungrateful for pregnancy or anything. It's just like you, it's like you kicked out an inconvenient roommate who was very right. inconvenient at the end. And then you're like, Oh, thankfully. So that and was, who was attached to your body. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. That is majorly inconvenient. And I remember, well, and for me too, like I would get at the end where the baby would be so low that every step you feel like those twinges and it's like, I can't do this anymore. Right. So that feeling of lightness. Yeah. That is almost immediate. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah. require weight loss really. It's, it's more right. that like the, the belly itself, the baby is somewhere else. Yep. Um, and they are somewhere else challenging and you, you can put them down for different a ways, <laughs> but you can tie yeah, your shoes exactly. and yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So my next one was, um, I had this kind of like perverse pleasure in continuing to wear maternity clothes for like, you know, three or four months with, while not pregnant. I, I don't, I, I just felt like I was getting away with something mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't, it sounds kind of silly. Like they look very different on you when you're not pregnant and sometimes they look terrible. Um, so I'd kind of whittle down my, I would whittle away at my um, wardrobe, but I just felt like I had this excuse to be in this sort of floppy middle ground <laughs> where I didn't you know, I, I made the common first time mom mistake and brought my old jeans to the hospital with me. Aww, the, first, the first baby. I know it was adorable of me. And then I learned, I was jeans. like, but they look so, they look plenty big. 
And I learned that lesson. And then I think after that, I, I went like so hard in the direction where I'm not even going to like get out my old clothes. Like I'm leaving those in drawers for a really long time. And I was just like wore my maternity clothes for a long time and just totally gave myself permission to do that and not to feel bad about it or like I had any expectation of myself to do anything different. And I really liked that. I felt like it was a very um, necessary breathing room yeah. that I didn't have to worry about something I had so little control over. And I didn't want to feel disappointed if I like tried to put something on and it didn't fit. So I just wore them. I just continued to wear my maternity clothes. And I actually had a couple tops that turned out looked really cute yeah. as non-maternity clothes. And I wore them for like a year. Well, okay. So, I'm glad you said that because I have a couple of things to add here. One is if they were things you wore at the very end, nothing looks good at the very end. I remember these like empire waist maternity tank tops where like um, the boob area was like ruched. So it was like, it was like fitted over your yes. boobs and then, yep. then it was, you know, made room for the belly below that. Those actually looked really cute postpartum because they were loose, but they, without the big belly, they looked totally different. So if, if it was the things you were wearing at eight and nine months pregnant, it's, it's likely you'll feel relatively svelte in them. So it's cause it's all right. compared to what you're comparing it to. You're not trying to compare it to your 10 months ago self, but to your nine months pregnant self, it may look rather flattering. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that I actually made a few key purchases for that time period. And it was usually in the form of pajama pants that were otherwise too big, like would have normally been too big, like a size or two mm -hmm. too big, um, or like a comfy sweater or something that I just, like you said, permission to be in this weird in between size and to kind of lean into the, the creature comforts, again, the sensory pleasures of fitting into clothing. So I agree. Yeah. And if that gives anybody permission to make just a couple of purchases, even though it's probably for an in-between time, I think you should go for it. So, Yes, absolutely. Well, and now, you know, leggings are so perfect. Nobody was wearing leggings. Right. Even when, even when Clara was born, I just don't feel like leggings no. as like, as a thing, as a, as an, as like daily wear were as much of a thing, yeah. but now it's like, oh, if only I had had that. Then. I can tell you. It would like hold you in and feel so supportive yeah. and. I can tell you that um, even the skinny, the skinny jean silhouette happened between my first pregnancy and my second. So between 2007 mm -hmm. and 2009, 10, um, yep. where everything went from wide or flare or just regular boot yep. cut um, because I had maternity jeans from the first time. And then the second time. I remember it was going to be like my first pair of like skinny jeans and thinking how silly that was. I was not skinny, but then all of a sudden the silhouettes were, you know, like, you know, at the ankle, like there was no flare yep. or so it's a, a lot changed in from your pregnancies to mine and the end of mine by Violet leggings were a thing. So, Well, and skinny jeans were, Clara was the only pregnancy where I wore skinny jeans because before that, like you said, they didn't, yeah. they weren't a thing. Yeah. And I remember being like, this is like the cutest pregnancy look. <laughs> like, I wish I had been able to do that with the other four because yeah. like the big belly with the skinny legs, I just felt like it was super adorable. And I was kind of mad that I only got to do it once. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <sighs> okay. Well, this is a, this is a big one. And I think if you have not leaned into this postpartum, here's your permission slip from us. I mean, you have an excuse to get out of anything that you don't want to do. And I know we're speaking from <laughs> COVID time. So social requirements and visitors and things like that. Family obligations look a little bit different now, but let's, let's set COVID aside for a second. Um, having a newborn and having just gone through birth or surgery, um, gives you license to say no to social obligations, to cancel plans at the last minute, to be 40 minutes late. Like you just, and maybe I'm, because I do hold myself to sometimes difficult standards. So maybe this is extra freeing for me. But it just feels like it's a it's a free pass. And I enjoyed that free pass, especially as it related to more introvert um, homebody tendencies that I already have. I just feel like it gave me I didn't have to explain anything. I could just opt yeah. out. And that included like, you know, sending my husband and, and one or two other kids to something and being like, oh, nope, she's home with the baby. So you get to be home with the baby as much as you want. And, and nobody nobody gets to say, you know, anything about it. I loved that. Well, and along those, those lines, you can kind of lean into whatever you want. So 
I actually had this boost of brain power right after having babies because usually my brain would like completely stop working at the end of a pregnancy <laughs> because all I could think about was getting the baby out. Like it's all I could think about. I was obsessed. And so for two or three weeks before baby was born, I would just go into this mental hibernation mode and then the baby would come out and I'd be like, okay, now my, I can think again. And I would be able to like lay around in bed with this newborn and all the other kids are off with, you know, dad or whoever. And I'm like writing in bed, mm -hmm. like, like manically, because all of a sudden I, I could do it and I had the focus and the time. Um, but you know, you could just as easily go in the other direction and just watch a bunch of bad TV. Like mm -hmm. you, you can lean in as much as you want. And honestly, you're so isolated. No one really knows what you're doing. Like <laughs> you're probably kind of in your bedroom or, you know, on the sofa or something, and you're not having people there and no one's, you're not expected to go anywhere. So you can just like lean into whatever it is, um, yeah. whether that's cranking out a bunch of, you know, mental um, productivity work or whether that's watching as much bad TV as you can. And I did both. Yeah. I watched a lot of bad TV. I did. I think I did. Um, the, my reality TV postpartum was the second time, the second pregnancy or the second baby because iPads were a thing and streaming mm. on like a tablet was relatively new. This is mid 2010. So the fact that I could have this little mini screen um, in the small room where I was nursing, I didn't have to like go like fire up the old family room TV. It felt like like. I don't know. It was no, it was new and it was sexy. And it was like, I remember watching that Nashville. Mm -hmm. Remember that, that drama Nashville. I only, I watched like one kind season. Of. It was, um, oh gosh, I forget the name of the actress. Anyway, you all listening will know, but, and I watched a lot of bachelor and bachelorette anyway. Um, and then the third time I didn't stream stuff cause I had more trouble falling back to sleep. So, uh, but yes, bad TV mm. totally allowed. Don't you think this is like a side commentary about how we Americans do postpartum, but don't you feel like the time, the statute of limitations on this lean into your energy patterns and indulge in what makes you feel good? It's like too short, right? Like in, it yes. should be three months. And for many people, it's like two weeks for some reason, either their, yeah. their own expectations or, you know, their husband goes back to work. There are other children to care for. There's no family in town, but it just kind of, it just stinks. I don't know what else I have to say about that, but we all know, we all can picture what you're describing, Megan, of like, you're, you know, in your little nest with the baby and you're, you, you can kind of create your own little world, but I feel like that doesn't last long enough for most people. And that's a bummer. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't. And it should. It should. Mm. All right. Well, we are going to take another break and come back with more things we love about postpartum. Megan, our sponsor trivia star is back today, and I want you to answer this question. In which animated film do Manny, Sid, and Diego try to return a lost child to his tribe? Well, that's easy, Sarah. It's Ice Age. Correct. My kids love that movie. Actually, I do too. Well, I'm actually pretty good at trivia, and I love trivia nights with friends. During the pandemic, when I can't go out, I can keep my skills sharp by playing Trivia Star, a fun and challenging mobile quiz app available for free in the Apple or Google App Store. Yes, this is such a fun way to fire up all that knowledge you've got in your brain somewhere and maybe even include your older kids in the challenge. Trivia Star has categories like Disney and animated movies, plus a bunch of others like music, sports, movies, TV, animals, celebrities, and the questions get harder over time, so you can really flex those trivia muscles as you play. Trivia Star has 2,000 five-star reviews in the Apple Store, and if you download and start playing right now, you'll get 2,500 coins and 500 gems. Those will help you advance if you get stuck on a hard level. Just go to the Apple or Google store and search for Trivia Star. Again, it's free to download and you'll get 2,500 coins and 500 gems when you search Trivia Star and download it today. Check it out. Sarah, pregnancy is really hard on women's bodies. I stay in pretty good shape, but no matter what, I have this pooch that is never going away. And trust me, I've had it almost 23 years now, so I know. <laughs> Sometimes it can be a bummer when there's that dress I know would look amazing on me, but it hits in just the wrong spot and it doesn't look the way I want it to. Well, you know, I always think you look amazing, Megan, but I know how it is to try to balance body positivity with needing just a little confidence boost sometimes. Our sponsor, Shapermint, understands that perfectly. They want women to be super body confident, but also have a little help with the spots that give them trouble. Shapermint is a line of smoothing, supportive shapewear that's also comfortable, lightweight, and breathable. You can find tanks, shorts, bodysuits, and more at shapermint.com. So last night I went out to dinner and I wore the Impetua high-waisted shaping leggings under a top that like kind of hits in the tummy area and is form-fitting, and I loved the look. 
The leggings are thick and textured, so they looked really substantial, but they also smoothed me out so much that I wasn't self-conscious about the form-fitting top. You know, I was really impressed by the prices too. And if you aren't in love with your shapewear purchase, you can exchange or return it within 60 days, no questions asked. In addition to the everyday discounts and promos ShaperMint has on their website, we have a deal just for our listeners that will save you an extra 10% on your order. Just go to shapermint.com slash mom hour and use our code mom hour. That's S-H-A-P-E-R-M-I-N-T dot com slash mom hour and the code mom hour to get our exclusive listener added discount of an extra 10% on your order. That's shapermint.com slash mom hour and the code is mom hour. All right. Well, my next one feels a little like a little woo woo or something. So hear me out on this one. Um, I had three C-sections, but I think there's probably a parallel um, if you deliver naturally. I was so impressed and kind of like in awe of the healing process, the physical healing process that happens over the first, I'm going to say like four to six weeks. Um, and how it's like, it's like watching, it's kind of like a pregnancy In a pregnancy, you gradually get bigger, you gradually, your body changes, but it's just as gradual and just as fascinating, I think, to watch your body return itself to neutral, whatever that mm. is. And, you know, I'm not talking about weight loss. That's that's different. I'm talking about like the actual healing of trauma, whether that's surgery or birth. And you don't have to do much for your body to actually perform that healing. You do have to give right. it. You have to rest. You have to. And that kind of like continues what we were talking about earlier is you can't like go back to training for a marathon on day four and you, you, you do need to give your body space to heal and to rest, but it's a dramatic change from day one post C-section, which is my experience. I always tell people like the first two days are really intense. The first week is pretty intense. And the first, you know, the first four weeks are when you're not, you're still not even supposed to drive or whatever. There is so much that happens from day one to call it day 28 or day 30. Um, And I think what's so, what I find so fascinating and kind of inspiring in hindsight is like my body just, it just did that. It just kind of knew what the new, the new normal or the new neutral was, and that's still a postpartum body. It's still a milk producing body. It's still going through hormonal changes. So uh, this is not at all about like bounce back to, to totally normal, but the return to the new normal, it's like, you're watching it happen in real time. Like one of those time-lapse photography things. So I, I just think that's pretty cool. That is cool. And you know, not having had C-sections, um, it, it, it's not as external that healing, um, or, but it, you can feel it happening. Like you're a little less sore on day three than you were on day one, or like, you know, you, if you figured out how to use the bathroom again or like, and you're, and it is very cool just to kind of witness that happening and feel it. Even if, you know, with, when it's all internal, you can't necessarily see it quite as much as when you have stitches on the outside, but, um, you do definitely feel the improvement day to day to day. And then there becomes that day where you're like, wow, like I feel normal again, or I feel whatever it is, not yeah. normal. It's a new normal, like you said, but yeah. like, I feel like someone, I don't, any, I don't anymore feel like someone who just had a baby. I don't yeah. feel anymore like someone whose body just did this really awesome, but, but pretty traumatic thing. Um, I just feel like a normal human and that's a weird and very cool process. Yeah. Um, and, and I see, yeah. oh, I, just one more thing. I, I was just yeah. going to say, I think what's so different about it is it's like a passive, it's a returning to like a neutral rather than a changing or progressing forward. And you don't have to do anything. You just have to be, and your body kind of knows where it needs to go. Okay. I'm done being woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think that was too woo woo, but you know, kind of, this is also maybe a little woo woo. Um, and not in the same way, but I was really into how much, and we've talked about this on this show before, about how in that new baby period, your life shrinks down so much. But part of that is the healing process you're going through. Part of that isn't, it isn't all about the baby. It's also about caring for yourself. And I remember the routine, um, like how simple, like how stripped down and simple it is to kind of just have your life revolve around like, 
hobbling to the bathroom, changing your pad, using the peri bottle, tracking your pain meds if you're taking them, mm-hmm. like all those things that that it's like re- it's like recovery from anything or even being sick. Like you you kind of have this little routine and it's everything is small mm-hmm. and um and it's same same. Like it's a it's redundant, but like you kind of know that every time you use the bathroom and you use that Perry bottle, that's one more time you won't have to, you know, mm-hmm. like that's one less time you'll have to later or like you'll, that at some point you'll be able to stop. And like when you're tracking the pain meds and you can start going a little longer in between or whatever, like there is like, it's that, um, the routine almost is the embodiment of the healing mm-hmm. and it also creates the healing. And there's something very like almost satisfying about that to yeah. me. I, so I, I think I there's, it's almost like, the smallest details, and you could extend this to the baby too, even though we're mostly talking about our ourselves. Um, the smallest details have a magnified importance, which pushes out unnecessary details, which is why we keep returning to this whole thing of like, you get to ignore the outside world if you want, because your entire right. purpose is so shrunken and clear. Mm-hmm. And then those little things are magnified. I mean, when you're having to pay attention to bowel movements, for two humans, yourself and the baby, like you can't care about the state of the world outside. And it is, it's, um, almost refreshing in a way or just simple. Um, this is one of those that might fall under, uh, rose colored glasses in hindsight. I'm I'm picturing people listening, (laughs) listening to us be like, yeah, but rolling their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I know. But like, I, but I literally do like even, I do remember actually finding some kind of pleasure in that, yeah. even though now, even though there was just as much soreness and it's a hassle and, you know, it's, and it can be, I don't know, not humiliating isn't the right word, but you're very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And like, if there's other people around, you feel like everyone's kind of aware of what's happening with your body and you yes. might need help. I mean, there's just a lot of just very, there's a very vulnerable, it's a vulnerable place to be, but there's something about it that I just, liked like I just found it kind of um like I have nostalgia yes I think that's that's a perfect way to put it um okay well my next one actually happens a little later in the fourth trimester um which if you know trimesters are they're 12 weeks right am I 12 13 Um, weeks yeah um 13 um so whenever this happens for you I'm talking about when you you start to venture out on your own or whatever version that is for you with a new baby. So for some people that might be two weeks or four weeks or six weeks, but you're out in the world, you're wearing publicly viewable clothing for yourself and a baby. And <laughs> publicly I, viewable, like that's like your, that's, suitable. that's your standard. It's publicly yeah. viewable. Like it's not yeah. indecent. Um, and I always got a little bit of like an, like an ego boost from making those first few ventures out into the world and, and getting nice, nice compliments or nice affirmations mm-hmm. from people. Now I know we tend to focus on like the weird comments people make, like when they think you're still pregnant, cause you've, you know, you've given birth recently and there's, there's plenty of clueless people, but there are also, I think you also get really nice people who say nice things. And I was thinking about when it's your first baby, everyone just wants to know, like, how old is the baby? How are you doing? Oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. And then if you have multiple kids with you, then you get all of the affirmation of like, wow, look at you. You've got like, for me, it was a newborn, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And you just kind of feel like a superhero. And if you've, if you have hunkered down for several weeks, it can feel good to get that affirmation that like, Hey, I I can do this. I can go out in the world. And you know, people want to peek at the baby if they can, or you just get nice. It's attention. It's, a, it's just feels it's yeah. like good feeling attention. And I always liked that. I wonder for, for moms who are having babies now during the times of COVID or who have during times of COVID, how all of these things are going to be so different. I just can't imagine how different, um, some of these things yeah. must feel. And that is something that people cannot experience right now. Yeah. Like you're not, unless you're like walking through a park and someone from six to 12 feet away says, Hey, you look great. Is that a new baby? Like, it's just not the intimacy yeah. of that experience, um, pre and, you know, one day post COVID. And I, I feel for the mamas listening to this and going, Oh, well, well, I know not that way for me. No. Yeah. Yeah. So agreed. Yeah. Um, <sighs> yeah. Okay. Well, I have another one and this one's very fluffy. It's stuff. Stuff. 
There's so much stuff associated with postpartum that you will never use except for during a very limited time of your life. Like I remember really um, geeking out on like herbal nipple salves <laughs> and like things that were like meant for your nethers, um, you know, like just things that were like tailor made to be used for a brand new mom. Yep. Herbal teas mm -hmm. that were made for new moms. Um, and some of it is baby stuff. Like, of course, I love little tiny onesies and little tiny, you know, little tiny sleepers and blankets, blankets, blankets. I was just talking with a friend the other day who's making a baby blanket for someone. And I said, I had so many baby blankets, including one Jenna made and she ran out of time. <laughs> so it was truly just like a knitted square that was just big enough to cover a newborn baby with Aww. but like you know so like a doll just, blanket it was like a doll blanket but I actually loved it because it didn't feel like it was so much extra material and it was just nice to like lay a baby down and have like one little blankie to tuck over them um and how like I would just have some blankets everywhere like yeah. stacks of blankets and I loved that and I and I, I never felt like I had too many I felt like there were never too many blankets in my postpartum mm -hmm. life for me and for baby and for all the different applications of blankets and yeah, I don't know. There's just something about all the stuff that is like really fun, but it's such a fleeting time. It is. And I think a, th a, a central theme that's emerging here is we as women can kind of deny ourselves little pleasures sometimes or be ultra practical or ultra frugal. And the postpartum period kind of is a free pass in a lot of ways. And I think buying stuff just falls under that category. I've talked before that in late pregnancy, my form of nesting was not cleaning, unfortunately, because my house would have been really clean if I had nested in that way. I would buy stuff and I'm not a big I'm not a big <laughs> online shopper or a buyer, but that was my way of nesting like, oh, I better pick up this on Amazon or I, I better get some extra of this. And I would kind of prepare my nest with those very specific things. And then once the baby was born, um, it's so funny, the difference between early 2008 and 2013, it's five, you know, it's five years of the time I had babies. But 2013, we were into one and two day Amazon delivery and just very mm -hmm. convenient. But 2008, of course, there was Amazon, but it wasn't quite as like instant it wasn't to same. go on your phone, like the phone in your yep. hand to your doorstep in 48 hours. So I remember buying things like for Violet. Um, these are both baby related purchases, but the nose Frida, the little um, snot sucker thing because she was a r super congested uh, two of my newborns were really nasally congested as newborns like that little snorty pig when they'd nurse yeah um, they didn't have colds but yeah. they just like their <laughs> passages were so tiny um so things like that and like gas drop bubble gas um drops for bubbly yeah. tummies and just feeling like um we were laughing about this recently in our back to school episode like throwing money at it like I'm just gonna like yeah. I'm just gonna buy stuff so I totally agree and I'm so glad you brought that up there is something indulgent and fun and almost like you know, there's so much that you can't do when you're postpartum you're stuck at home blah 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 and so buying stuff feels like a way to I don't know feather your nest take care of yourself mm -hmm. um and there are fun products just for just for you many of them involving yep. nipples see what I did there you <laughs> brought it right <laughs> you, you brought the nipples forward and I can't wait to continue <laughs> with the nipples in the future you know what we should do it like an easter egg like um you know, like video games yeah. have like a hidden yes. Easter egg somewhere in the nipples. episodes. We should like somehow have like nipples get maybe like vaguely brought up. And then um, whoever can identify. I just think that'd be hilarious at one oh point. I don't gosh. know how we would do that. But yes, like, me tell neither. us the timestamp of when we brought up nipples. Yeah, it'll be like we'll a, be entered for you'll a, get a prize. prize. Oh, my yep. gosh. Um, OK, well, we saved um, perhaps the most obvious one for last. But how can we not talk about it? And that is you get a baby. So in, <laughs> in they go together in yep. this, in this tough postpartum period, you also have a little friend. And I think for me, that is what it felt like. It felt like my buddy, you know, you're rarely, mm -hmm. at least I was rarely separated from my newborn, except for a little few hours of sleep stretches here or but I didn't really go anywhere or leave a newborn with anyone. So it felt like a we, um, like it felt like, you know, me and the baby, this is like, we're a little team. Um, and it's, there's, I, I'm sure biological reasons why they're so dang cute and they smell so good. Um, because it does hopefully offset some of the less pleasant parts of 
postpartum. So you have talked about really loving newborns, right? Like I do. I really do love newborns. Um, which is not to say that I really care that much about other people's newborns anymore. I think I'm out of that phase where like I would see a newborn and my, you know, body would clench down and I would just want, I would just want one of those. Um, I don't really feel that way anymore, but I really loved that phase. I love the little sounds that they make. I love how they're all squished up and they grunty. And then when they stretch and their little fingers go like, mm-hmm. you know, like everything about that. Um, and there's so mine weren't particularly small newborns. So they never had that real fragile feeling like mine came out. They, mine were um, your smallest was brawny. In eight, eight. <laughs> my, right? I had brawny babies. So my smallest baby was eight, six. Yeah. That, yeah. Clara. Um, and the rest were like eight, 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 nine, nine, 12 and 10, two. So they were, they came out, you know, ready to go, like pretty cooked, you know, and like. <laughs> They could hold their heads up. So there was a lot. I never really had that. I am going to break this baby feeling, which I think made it a little more relaxed, but they just, there was just something about like, they're so like soft and squishy and kind of ugly, but like adorably ugly. (laughs) And like, it's just, I like, I really like the newborn phase. Um, But I agree that they felt like your sidekick. Yeah. And I, and, and like, I would talk to them all day, but like kind of talking to myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember having this really weird feeling when Jacob was a little, little guy, like a couple weeks old where I was looking at him and I felt like I was looking at myself. It was the weirdest feeling. And I remember thinking it's like, he's just like, he's like a limb. Yeah. He's like my arm or Mm -hmm. something. And thinking how, I don't know, just like that really stuck with me. I never really forgot that feeling of my identity being so wound up with another person Mm -hmm. um, and then repeating that with four different, completely different humans and never really having that feeling again, once they, you know, once they start to separate, which they have to do, Mm -hmm. um, you don't really get that feeling back. It's just such a strange uh, novel period Mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. And, and the baby is a big part of postpartum turns out, turns out, Um, out. I I was thinking about this because there's a big difference between a, the first week of a new baby and say a six week old or an eight week old. And I, I, I mean, of course I loved my newborns who were on the more petite side compared to yours. I had six, 15, seven, two and seven, four. So they were all on either side of seven pounds, little, not, not tiny, but smaller. Um, I would never say that the brand new newborn is my favorite baby phase. And I think it's because it's impossible for me to separate that from kind of the intensity of sleeplessness, exhaustion and, and healing and all the things that we've been talking about, but a six week old or eight week old, a a smiling baby who's sleeping longer Mm. stretches at night that falls in this, we're, you know, we're talking about this whole fourth trimester. That's part of it too. And just like I was talking about how much the body changes in six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. So does that baby. I mean, a three month old baby is so different than a three day old baby. And when you do this over and over again, you kind of know that's coming, which I think it does. It did help me appreciate the newborn days even more. Cause you just know, it sounds so cliche, but like, it's just not going to be like this for very long. Like the, the right. tininess and the, the depths of that kind of exhaustion, both the good and the bad doesn't last very long because by eight, 12 weeks, you're, it's a different, you're a different body. And so is that little baby. So I, maybe it's just like the fleetingness is what makes it kind of special and gives us nostalgia, yeah. nostalgia for it. But yeah, when you see a brand new baby, I mean, everybody forgets how tiny they are. Even the, even the hefty ones are pretty tiny. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, they really are. Well, this has been really fun. Um, thanks for listening everybody. And definitely check out the show notes for the other episodes we mentioned, um, at the beginning that are all about the postpartum period. Um, we've, you know, we've covered this kind of a lot and it's always fun to revisit, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of content out there. And if you are not loving the fourth trimester at all right now, and if you're having a hard time, you know, please know that you're not alone and we are not trying to, I don't know, make light of it or gloss over it. Um, this is the sunny side of an experience that can be really intense and and negative for yeah. a lot of women. So we just want to make sure that that's clear. Yeah, I think that's important to say. And, you know, if you're feeling crappy right now, it won't feel like this forever. And you don't have to feel crappy. There are definitely ways to get help. So we'll put some links in the show notes um, just for some easy ways to reach out if you feel like gosh, I could be enjoying this fourth trimester a little more, or I don't want to feel the way I'm feeling. Uh, You don't have to. So that's important to say. 
Okay, before we wrap, I wanted to let everyone know that this Friday is our October Voices episode, and I will be talking to Daisy, who is a personal stylist um, and the founder of Mindful Closet. I am really excited about this because I was telling Sarah, and this is where this kind of idea came, that I am right in the middle of my um, seasonal clothing swap over, which is always difficult because... This time of year in Michigan, the weather is so un- unpredictable. Like I will probably be wearing a tank top and potentially shorts today, <laughs> but in the morning it's 50 degrees, you know? So it's like, it, it's just all over the place yeah. and you never really know when it's time to just call it and put the shorts away. Yeah. And you're usually like a week too early. And then you think, ah, oh, I wish they were out. But anyway, when I was starting to kind of dig into that, I looked at my closet and my wardrobe and I had this feeling like I just wanted to burn it all down. Start like, over. I want to start over and definitely like capsule wardrobes have been something that has been kind of, you know, on everyone's um, minds, but on my mind for a long time. But I also live in a place with four seasons. I have, um, you know, I have a very active in different ways kind of lifestyle and it's really hard. So I'm excited. I think Daisy is going to really help me um, kind of wrap my brain around where to go with my wardrobe and excited about it. So I check it out. Really excited about that. Definitely check that out. And if you listened on Sunday, you heard us talk about our virtual retreat coming up on November 7th. Um, if you if you didn't hear that episode, we talk about it quite a bit in the beginning of um, Sunday's More Than Mom just two days ago. So you can go back in your feed and listen to us chat about that in the first few minutes of the episode. Um, and we will throw a link in the show notes for more information because we're really excited about that, giving us something to look forward to this fall. So yeah. And maybe there's some postpartum postpartum mom is listening to it right now that are like, yep, that's me. I need that. Yep. Shut your door. Retreat. <laughs> Shut your door with your <laughs> newborn buddy and uh, join yep. us on November 7th. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.